demons, monsters, and ghosts do have some attractive power because they are different than the human standard. We humans have power also, but are suppressed because we have been doing something that suppresses all our power or we vow to work without the power because in the Maya world, which is this world, you know, you're not allowed to use power. If you came from heaven, you're not allowed to use obvious magical power to attract people. Only the demons, monsters, and devils can do that because they have controlled this world since long ago. So whoever came from heaven has to, you know, kind of sign a contract to be quiet, to work quietly or else. But to be a master, you can't work quietly. Sooner or later, people will tell each other, will tell far and wide, and the master always gets into trouble. You name any master that doesn't have trouble. No, none. None of the real masters lived a peaceful and wonderful life. Well, of course, in some, in some period of time, when there was peace in some peaceful countries, probably lucky masters, but rarely any. Yeah, rarely. Mostly they were being tormented all their lives and die brutally, if a real master is like that. Because the Maya knows who the real masters are, so they will be after them. To obstruct and or eliminate the masters and their teaching. Those are lousy monks and preaching nonsense. Monks, I even saw a monk, a Buddhist monk, who preached to his followers, his faithful monks and nuns, that there's no Amitabha Buddha land. It's just a theory. And also there is no hell. The hell concept has just been introduced 500 years ago. No, no, in the Buddha's time already we have hell. That's why his disciple, Mukhen Lien, Mao Gai Yayana, had to go to hell and then come back and beg the Buddha to rescue his mother who cheated the monks and give them meat to eat, telling them that it's vegan food. And the one who destroyed the Buddha's clan also went to hell directly, immediately after that, after he killed and massacred the Buddha's clan brutally. He and his whole army drowned in the flood, suddenly died, just like that, all of them, and went to hell, a vicious or relentless hell. That's in the Buddhist Sutra. It's not I who say it. Họ thách liền cho mở cửa thành, khi ấy vua Lưu Ly liền bảo quần thần. Nay, nhân dân họ thách rất nhiều, chẳng phải đau kiếm có thể hại hết được, nên đem chôn chân trong đất, rồi sau cho voi giữ đạp chết. Bấy giờ, quần thần văn lệnh vua liền dùng voi đạp chết những người ấy. Thế Tôn bảo các tỳ kheo, nay vua Lưu Ly và quân lính này chẳng còn ở đời bao lâu nữa, sau bảy ngày sẽ bị tiêu diệt. Vua Lưu Ly sai người đếm ngày, đến đầu ngày thứ bảy, đại vương mừng rỡ không thể tự kiềm, Đêm các quân binh cùng các thể nữ đến bên bờ sông A Chỉ La, vui chơi rồi nghỉ ở đó. Nửa đêm, có mây bất ngờ kéo đến, gió to mưa lớn rất mau. Vua Lưu Ly và quân lính bị nước cuốn hết, tất cả đều tự tiêu diệt, thăng hoài mạng chung sanh vào trong địa ngục A Tỳ. Lại có lửa trời đốt cung điện trong thành. Bấy giờ, Thế Tôn liền nói kệ, Tạo ác thật quá sức, đều do thân miệng làm, thân này chịu khổ não, thọ mạng cũng ngắn ngủi. Nếu lúc ở tại nhà, thì bị lửa thiêu đốt. Nếu lúc mạng đã hết, ác sanh trong địa ngục. So how can that monk who's supposed to be a famous monk in the high rank of monkhood, oh his name is Thích Nhật Tử, a priest and tell his People that there's no hell and no Amitabha Buddha's land. Và dựa vào nhà Phật giáo Nguyên Thủy đó, thì rõ ràng đó hình ảnh địa ngục chỉ là một phương tiện để giáo dục đạo đức thôi. Bởi vì uh, tất cả đều tái sinh ngay lập tức, thì còn đâu mà tồn tại ở dưới địa ngục? Niệm Phật có giảng sanh cực lạc Tây Phương được hay không? Câu trả lời, nếu đúng với lịch sử, 
và dựa vào bài kinh thứ 18 kinh trường bộ là không vì tây phương cực lạc không có thật. My disciples even went to Amitabha Buddha's land and describe what it is all about. Each of Master's disciples has similar, different, or more inner spiritual experiences and or outer world blessings. These are just some samples. Usually we keep them to ourselves as per Master's advice. Tian Tang Yoji, Ami Tuo Fo de Xi Fang Ji Le Shi Jie, Huo Ji Le Jing Tu. Shi Fu Cheng Kai Shi Guo, Wo Men Gen Shi Fu Xie Da Zuo. 就是每天在世往生，灵魂神识能够在天堂与尘世之间来来去去，不必等到真正肉身往生才能看到天堂。我有幸能几次在打坐中去到阿弥陀佛的西方极乐世界或极乐净土参观。但我并不是修净土宗，而是修习青海无上师传授的观音法门，就能在还在世时去到西方极乐世界游玩。所以，观音法门是非常圆通的法门，是万法之宗。我看到的西方极乐世界。就跟佛教经典说的一样，黄金铺地，宫殿都是软软的、有弹性的黄金所建成，透明又放射出金光。殿内、殿外、柱子上都镶有七彩或是九彩宝石，一切都是光的组成。那边的光亮建筑有各种我们地球上的古建筑形式，有华丽佛教形制的，有伊斯兰教形制的，或者是典雅的天主教古建筑形式。因为地球的建筑都是模仿天堂的，天堂的建筑物实在太漂亮了。没办法用世界语言描述，宫殿都有自己的意识，就像活的生物一样，我们都能跟宫殿沟通。而且，虽然表面上看有门，但是我们可以不通过门就穿透进去，没有什么阻。那个世界的花草颜色特别透明，特别光亮。都会唱歌，树木也全是闪闪发光，亦会发出一种精细的震动频率，就像在歌咏一般那些光太强了，所以刚进去的时候看不清是树木还是花草，连动物族人都在发光。嗯、那边的山虽然也是绿色的，但是特别亮，颜色很鲜明。我先到西方极乐世界的下品下生之处参观，这里的人是在地球上有福报，或者是念过阿弥陀佛业障少的人。他们刚来这里的时候，要先洗干净在地球被大染缸污染的部分。慢慢洗干净之后，再进入到中品。中品开始比较有打坐修行，但杂念还比较多。我看到有些人还会想念以前当人时候的享受，比如说想吃什么，只要想一想，那些食物就出现，让他享受。
，想要什么东西都能马上用意念造出来。比较值得注意的是，我看到有些戒律比较清楚、修行净土宗的出家人，往生到下品或是中品。会后悔，当他们在有人类肉身的时候，没有好好修行，到了那里又想努力修行。因此，在极乐净土，每一品都有佛菩萨慈悲去讲经教导。如果是观音菩萨讲经的时候，一切众生都会神奇的全部变成十七八岁那种少女的模样听经，服饰也都是一致的。然后观音菩萨用震动频率讲经，所有的人就都听懂观音菩萨讲什么。我还见到，要是阿弥陀佛来讲经。那每个人都会神奇的变成男的童子来听经，阿弥陀佛也不用言语，都用震动频率来讲，大家就都听懂。讲完经，大家再按照自己的频率变回自己原本的穿戴，很有意思。我也在里面跟着听经。在那边，每个人都有家，那个家就是一朵莲花。每个人都在自己的莲花台里面打坐、修行、念经等等。一朵莲花是比地球还大，因为阿弥陀佛的一只眼睛就像宇宙那么大了，所以西方极乐世界的众生也相应的。非常非常大，不像我们地球人类这么小。这里虽然是佛国，可是如果修行不好，莲花会干枯，没有光，骗不了人。经典记载，西方极乐世界有很出名的八功德水。我看见那是透明的水。殊胜特性为澄净、清冷、甘美、清软、润泽、安和、除饥渴、长养诸根。我们灵魂外面有脏的东西，都可以去那里洗。洁净之后，再回自己的房子、莲花里边，继续修行打坐。西方极乐世界。只有快乐，没有痛苦烦恼，所以叫做极乐净土。西方极乐世界的上品，则几乎都是佛菩萨在居住的，他们在那里学习宇宙法律和宇宙的奥秘，准备普度众生，期许自己成为品阶更高的佛菩萨。这是在那里生活的努力目标。几次极乐净土访问过后，感想是，大家要趁着还有人参的时候，努力吃素修行，过道德爱心的生活，并精进修习最高等的观音法门。那么，不用等到往生。就可以用神识去到各种高等天堂游历，天堂都欢迎我们这样的修行人。师父更已经为好弟子与好人备妥新乐土，那更是殊胜无比的美妙天堂。感恩师父，施恩难报，弟子在此三叩首。中国极光镜上 ，and even one monk in Vietnam, he say he can see Amitabha Buddha's land like the lines on his palm. 
ai mà đọc tới kinh kim cang chuyển biến sát na thì sẽ hiểu được thế giới của a di đà hồi đó hồi xưa tôi không tin và bây giờ tôi không có vấn đề tin hay không tin mà tôi thấy thấy thế giới cực lạc như thấy chỉ trên bàn tay đó nó rõ như vậy thành ra quý vị làm sao được nhất niệm mà nếu nhất niệm thì giáng sinh về cõi trời so quite few people can see amitabha buddha's land how can you as a monk say that there's no amitabha buddha's land he say it's just a concept and no hell even wow 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 Hopefully he doesn't have to go to hell to find out. There's one nun. She wrote her hell experience. She used to sell chicken and duck people, and she went to hell and they punished her. She almost had to be gone forever, but because Kwan Yin Bodhisattva interfered and helped her, then she had to be punished for some time temporarily, and then she was released and came back to continue her nun practice more diligently. Khi đó khoảng 10 giờ sáng, tôi thấy mình lạc vào một khung cảnh đẹp đẽ, cây cối xanh tươi. Có một chiếc cầu rất dài, tôi bước lên cầu đi được một lúc thì cầu đổ sụp xuống, tôi té nhào xuống sông, chật vật bơi mãi không vào được. Thật lạ, bờ sông ở ngay đó nhưng bơi mãi không thể tới, lúc đó tôi cảm thấy chơi vơi, vô cùng sợ hãi. Dần dần, dòng nước đó đưa tôi ra cửa biển, nước trở nên rất lạnh bút thấu tìm gan tôi nhìn quanh thấy không chỉ có mỗi mình mình mà có vô số người khác cũng trôi giạt theo dòng nước vào biển lạnh này người tây có người ta có âu có á có già trẻ nam nữ đều có người tôi bị lạnh quá trở nên cứng đờ ra quá sợ hãi tôi nghe thấy một giọng từ trên cao nhắc hãy niệm phật tôi nghe theo cố hết sức niệm mãi mới phát âm được chữ phật phật Dần dần niệm được A-di-đà-phật Rồi đầy đủ câu Nam-mô-A-di-đà-phật Nhờ đó tôi cảm thấy dễ chịu hơn rất nhiều Khi này tôi quay sang với lấy hai người kề bên Niệm Phật giúp họ Cuối cùng nó đã đưa tôi tới một tòa thành to lớn Phía sau là núi cao vời vời Khi bước lên tòa thành Tôi kinh hoàng nhận thấy các vị đầu trâu mặt ngựa Các vị quỷ vương to lớn khủng khiếp Số lượng đông đảo vô cùng Người nào người nấy to như một trái núi Tiếp đó Một vị quỷ vương dẫn tôi đến một cánh cửa Cánh cửa ấy tự động mở ra Ánh hào quang bừng sáng vô cùng huy hoàng và mỹ diệu Lúc này tôi nhận ra địa tạng vương Bồ Tát Quán thế âm Bồ Tát Và chuẩn đề Bồ Tát Uy nghi ngự trên đài Lập tức tôi cúi đầu quỷ lạy ba vị Sau đó tôi được ba vị hướng dẫn phát lồ Sám hối các ác nghiệp Sám hối xong Hai vị quỷ vương dẫn tôi vào các địa ngục, bắt đầu chuyến du hành khủng khiếp có 102. Địa ngục thực sự vô cùng khổng lồ, không dựa vào thần thông của các vị quỷ vương, không thể đi hết. Cửa địa ngục đầu tiên mở ra là ngục bất hiếu. Đập vào mắt tôi là những chồng sắt ghê rợn trên một bàn trông khổng lồ, có hình tròn. Số lượng người trên bàn trông đó đồng không thể tính kể. Các quỷ vương đẩy những tội hồn lơ lửng trên không trung, rồi bị các tảng đá từ trên cao đè xuống, cắm phập vào trồng sắt to như ngón tay, máu tuôn ra xối xả. Hình phạt đó, cũng như mọi hình phạt khác, cứ lập đi lập lại rồi nối nhau không ngừng. Chỗ khác, có những bàn băng lạnh, tội hồn nằm, ngồi ngổn ngang trên đó, lạnh thấu xương tủy. Hai vị quỷ vương nói, đó là quả do bỏ bố mẹ chịu đói chịu lạnh. Tiếp theo, tôi được dẫn vào địa ngục thứ hai, tên là Vô Gián. Mục này do phạm 80 tội danh khác nhau mà tội hồn phải vào đây, như mua gian bán lận, cướp đoạt hại người, cho vay nặng lãi, bóc lột người làm công, anh em tranh giành gia tài. Các hình phạt ở đây rất đa dạng như đổ nước đồng sôi vào mồm, móc lưỡi kéo ra chặt hay chặt tay, chặt chân, cho rắn bọ cạp cắn xé, vân vân. Các tội hồn gào thét kinh hồn, giả sử mà có máy quay ghi lại thì không bộ phim kinh dị nào có thể so sánh được. Đảm bảo ai xem rồi thì thả chết cũng không dám phạm tội. Tiếp đến, tôi được dẫn vào ngục đại thập ác. Các hình cụ rất nhiều, cối xay, đinh đâm, cột đồng lửa, vân vân. Có một vạc dầu cực kỳ khổng lồ như một cái hồ lớn. Bên trong người người lúc nhúc chìm nổi gào thét. 
tội hồn phải đọa vào đây vì các tội giết người, phá thai, gian dâm, loạn luân, hành nghề mại dâm, vân vân. Tiếp đến là địa ngục hòa thiêu, đầu đầu cũng là lửa cháy rực, dành cho những người làm thầy giáo, cô giáo, học trò phạm tội, như thầy dạy giấu nghề, dạy sai giáo án, không có lương tri, hại trò, trò đánh thầy, giết thầy, vân vân. Tiếp nữa là ngục thập nhị tội ác, dành cho 12 đại tội gây nguy hiểm cho xã hội. Những tội hồn bị vào đây rất khó được thoát ra mà siêu sinh cõi khác. Trong ngục có một biển nước lạnh giá, dưới nước là các quái vật hùng dữ, bên trên là đủ thứ hình cụ nhìn lạnh xương sống. Gặp rất nhiều tăng ni bị xuống địa ngục Tôi rụng rời khi nhận ra người gì họ của mình đang ở trong đó, trong biển người trùng trùng điệp điệp. Bà bị các đầu trâu mặt ngựa kéo thân xác chặt chém liên tục, máu thịt vườn vãi đập đìa. Nếu cố vùng vẫy bỏ chạy thoát ra, lập tức sẽ bị các hình cụ móc sắt bên trên ập tới đầm nát thân. Tôi cố gọi người gì, nhưng tội hồn ở đây giống như không có tai, không thể nghe thấy được. Khi còn sống, vào thời chế độ cũ, người gì này hành nghề buôn bán ma túy từ Campuchia về bán trong nước. Cuộc sống giàu sang, tiền bạc, nhà cửa, xe cộ thừa mứa, con cái ăn xài phung phí. Sau năm 1975, bao ứng hiện tiền ập đến. Gia sản tiêu tán không còn gì Con cái bất hiếu Lưu lạc mỗi đứa một nơi Ngày bà lìa đời tiền mua cỗ quan tài Cũng không có Nhưng người đời chỉ nhìn được một chút ít quả báo đó mà thôi Chứ đâu biết báo ứng Còn gấp triệu tỷ lần thê thảm hơn thế Ở dưới địa ngục này Người tu hành giả Bị trừng phạt nghiêm khắc Ngục kế tiếp tôi được dẫn tới Tên là Đại A Tì Đúng như tên gọi Ngục này lớn hơn nhiều các ngục khác mang một vẻ âm u, rung rợn, khó tả. Ngục này dành cho những người giả tu của các tôn giáo khác nhau như Phật giáo, Thiên Chúa giáo, Hồi giáo và nhiều các tôn giáo khác gồm hàng trăm thứ tội khác nhau như đánh mắng bậc chân tu, lạm dụng tài vật, phá giới, tù không giới hạnh, đưa người nhà vào nắm quyền trong chùa, giả danh người xuất gia chuộc lợi, xây chùa giả chuộc lợi, giảng giải sai lệch Phật Pháp, mê hoặc người đời, vân vân. Tôi được các vị quỷ vương chỉ cho một ông sư đã lên sức thượng tọa, khoảng hơn 70 tuổi, mặc áo màu vàng, đang ngồi trên bàn trông, bị chó cắn xé tay chân, trên đầu thì quạ mổ mắt, máu me đầm đìa ghê sợ. Ông giải thích loạn bệnh Phật Pháp, thường xuyên đăng đàn giảng nói, công kích các bậc chân tu. Không những thế, ông còn lấy tiền cúng dường để từ lợi riêng, mua nhà cho họ hàng đứng tên, tạo nghiệp sâu dày. Cuối cùng, sau khi dẫn tôi dạo qua các hình ngục khác nhau, các quỷ vương đưa tôi trở lại chỗ ban đầu, diện kiến, cung kính đảnh lễ ba vị quán thế âm Bồ Tát, địa tạng Bồ Tát, chuẩn đề Bồ Tát. Đảnh lễ xong, các vị Bồ Tát bảo tôi hãy niệm Phật. Cung kính làm theo, tôi thấy mình bay bổng lên không trung, rồi trở lại nhân gian, nhập vào xác. Lúc đó là 12 giờ trưa, kết thúc chuyến đi với những trải nghiệm rùng rợn, kinh hoàng nơi địa ngục. So many stories, not just the nuns. I'm just telling she's a nun because she would not lie to you. Those among the nuns do lie for their own profit. I don't know why. They truly did not study Buddhism. They don't feel afraid of karma. Or maybe they came from hell themselves. Or they are the children of the Mara king, as he vowed to send his children to be monks and nuns to destroy Buddhism. Yeah, otherwise they wouldn't have said such things. Because for Buddhism, Amitabha Buddha's land is, oh, it's so popular. A lot of people can't do much anything, so they just recite Amitabha Buddha's name because he has unlimited light. His light is shining everywhere, even into hell, even though the hell people cannot see it. So people believe in Amitabha Buddha greatly because he's famous and he's uh, Liberation method is easy, according to Buddhism. People just recite Amitabha Buddha non-stop with one-pointedness and also imagine, visualize his land as Sekamoni Buddha described to them. This was because one time Sekamoni Buddha responded to a queen's prayer, took pity on her, used his light body to go into a prison where the queen was 
incarcerated to teach her this method of reciting Amitabha Buddha's name. So she became liberated after her death. They will be reborn into the Amitabha Buddha's land in different levels, from the lowest to the highest, gradually, with time. Yeah, it depends on how sincere you are, how concentrated you are when you're reciting the Buddha's name and when you visualize his holy land. After worshipping him, Queen Vaidehi raised her head and saw Shakyamuni Buddha, the World Honored One. I beseech you, World Honored One, to reveal to me a land of no sorrow and no affliction where I can be reborn. Then the World Honored One said to Vaidehi, Do you know that Amitabha is not far away? Fix your thoughts upon and contemplate that Buddha land. In each region of this jeweled land, there are 500 gotis of jewel pavilions in which innumerable divas play heavenly music. There are also musical instruments suspended in the sky, which, like those on the heavenly jeweled banner, spontaneously produce tones even without a player. Each tone proclaims the virtue of mindfulness of Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. When this contemplation has been accomplished, it is known as the general perception of the jeweled trees, jeweled ground and jeweled ponds of the land of utmost bliss. This is a composite visualization and is called the sixth contemplation. Those who have perceived these objects will be rid of extremely heavy evil karma which they have committed during innumerable kalpas or eons and will certainly after death be born in that land. Amita Yur Dhyana Sutra Amitabha Buddha is one of the most beloved Buddhas. So if you are a Buddhist monk and you say there is no Amitabha Buddha's land, I don't know how people will react to that. I myself refuse that talk. That's garbage. That's nonsense. That's non-existent. That's anti-Buddha. That's disrespectful to Amitabha Buddha and disrespectful to all the Buddhas. Disrespectful to all Buddhists. Disrespectful to Sekamoni Buddha, under whose name he became a monk and became famous, well-known and trusted by many of the Buddhist faithful who follow him. That's very disrespectful to the whole Buddhism in total. So I truly don't understand nowadays what kind of monks people have become. Uh, you judge for yourself, okay? I just tell you the truth, that Mr. Tetnyata said that. You can read his talk, and he also swears in front of the public. That's the truth. I don't want to judge or anything. I just tell you the truth. You can look on YouTube or the Internet. I just happened to see it. And some of my team printed it and gave it to me to read also. Yeah, maybe we can uh, share that if uh, they can find it again, some of his talks. And even uh, teaching uh, followers how to have sex and stuff like that. Huh? Do we need a monk to teach such things? Nowadays, they can read it anywhere. Trong nhân quả, nếu các bạn sử dụng các dụng cụ để hỗ trợ cho cái thỏa mãn tính dục của mình, cũng không có tội gì hết. Đức Phật cũng không sẽ nói là cái tội. They have it before everybody is born even. Before we even know we, we have this planet, humans already know what to do for such things. Such things don't need a monk to mention. Yeah, yeah they just say anything. It's beyond my understanding. But as the Buddha said, in this Dharma ending age, you know, monks are not monks. As the Buddha said, in this Dharma ending age, monks are not monks. Maybe some are not real monks. Some are wearing colorful chasa, just like the Buddha said. That these uh, fake monks like to wear colorful chasa. Fake monks also eat meat and drink alcohol, gamble. All kind of things the so-called monks are doing nowadays. 
and molesting children, molesting women and men. It's all over the Internet. Oh, I wish I never had made that discovery. Oh, it really feels so disturbing. I wish I haven't known all this. I haven't known all this for all these decades since I came out to do my mission. And I heard even recently somewhere it said that the Catholic monks committed more of those sins, molesting children or doing same-sex marriage, molesting women, men and all that. I said, Buddhists don't have that. I really heard it. Oh, my God, I was so wrong. I was so wrong. I said that because the Buddhist monks have 250 precepts, so it's not possible. It's very detailed about all kinds of moral principles you have to keep. So Buddhist monks could not do any sexual harassment or molest other faithful or other monks and nuns. Ah, my God, I was so wrong. I did not read too much on the Internet. I never did want to. Just recently, I wanted to know about peace in the world. And then so I opened that and Pandora's box all came out, tumbling out, falling out all over. I wish I didn't have to know all this. It really disturbed me too much. Oh, it broke my illusion. I read that the Buddha said that Mara will send his children to be monks and nuns and use all this kind of uh, monks' robes and dress in style to destroy Buddha's teaching. When Shakyamuni Buddha was about to enter Nirvana, he summoned the demon king and commanded him, you should abide by the rules. Follow the rules from now on. Don't violate them. The demon king replied, So you want me to follow your rules? Fine. During the ending age of your dharma, I will wear your garments, eat your food, and defecate in your arms bowl. His meaning was that he would destroy the dharma from within. When the Buddha heard that, he was worried. He wept and said, There's really nothing I can do about you. Your method is the most poisonous, the most destructive. A commentary by the venerated Master Sun Hua, vegetarian, of the Shurangama Sutra. And the Buddha cried. My goodness. The Buddha is so sensitive, so loving, so kind. He even cried when he saw a woman's uh, bones after they died. The woman's bones are black not like the white bones from the men, because the women have monthly loss of blood, have children and take care of children and husband and the household and all that, so their bodies are not as healthy. After death, all their bones become black, and Buddha cry in front of a big, huge uh, pile of women's bones. You see how loving, kind and compassionate the Buddha is. How can... Anybody who follows him not have enough respect for him to keep his doctrine and to teach righteousness, moral conduct, and even compassion. I hardly hear any monks nowadays talking about compassion, trying to teach their followers to emphasize the love that the Buddha wants people to keep, to nourish, to mature in, and to live in love. Okay, now I ask uh, some questions concerning the four sentences that the saints of Kaudaism measure on Pueblo. Uh, oh, I say, why you tell me then? They say, because I have more means to publicize this to their global believers to make the world people know more than just from the ordinary uh, Kaudai faithful. They told me that the inner world wants people to know. And then uh, I said, but he praised me before. Maybe it's a mistake. He made a mistake or something. They say no, he did it on purpose. He twisted everything just to suit his desire, his lowly ambition. But he make it all messy, you know. I think he doesn't have enough wisdom. He just wants to have the title, but then what would he do with it for the world anyway? 
all these decades, he just ate and slept and did not do much, just rely on Kaudaism to survive and maybe talking to outside people to make offerings to him. And now he wants the title. So I say, why did he praise me before then? When I first saw that, I thought, oh, he's such a good, wise person. Who is he? Well, I didn't have time to check out much about him. So later I asked uh, my disciples to find out, and they say to me, oh, Hui Bu is uh, one of the uh, um, mediums in Kaudaism. And then I knew, say, oh, he is Kaudai. Why does he praise me? They should praise their own saints, you know? Because Kaudaism is very enlightening religion. It's symbolized by the eye in the middle of the forehead. That we all know is the third eye, eye of wisdom, eye of the soul, yeah? The Kaudaism founder saw the eye in one of his visions while he was on the beach of the ocean. But it's not like he saw it on the beach, it's just that he was tuned in at that time. Even if he saw the ocean in front of him, he was already tuned in with the inside, higher inner world with the saints and sages who saw him vision, saw him some teaching through the vision, meaning emphasizing that people, the faithful, should concentrate on the third eye while they are doing meditation, praising or worshiping. Because the third eye is where you should concentrate. That we also teach during the Kuan Yin Method initiation. So I say then, why did he have to praise me? For what? At that time, I didn't read much of his uh, writings on the Internet. Uh, I just read one time that he praised me and, like, sympathized with me. I was surprised and touched. I say, why did he have to do that? So His Majesty, the Kaudai King, actually told me then, because Hui Bu wants your disciples, what he said exactly. Yeah, put it in quotation marks. Because he will want your disciples to trust him, then he will uh, later on have more strategy to take over your mission, which you built with sweat and tears. He claimed to be even your master before, in the past lives, which is all fake, is what all the saints told me, yeah? For that same reason, because he wants to take over your mission, which you built with all your love and labor, and he wants to take it over because he wants to have more power, more fame, more people offering to him. This event makes me remember one of my childhood stories. I was only about uh, eight, very, very young and still in primary school. I wrote some poems, of course, and uh, one day I wrote a poem, kind of one page long, in which I used all the subjects in the school to weave into poetry. And it was very beautiful and very exact, very accurate about school, about all the subjects we learn and things that happen or what the teachers say in what class and all that. But then uh, I lost it. I went to a neighbor's house for something and I lost it because I probably had my school book with me and that paper was separate. I took out one paper and wrote it on there and I lost it. I didn't know I lost it there actually, but later on I knew I lost it there. So when I came home, I couldn't find it. I didn't know where to find it, so it was okay. What to do? One day I went back to that neighbor's house again that neighbor's house are very kind. Actually, they have three children. One eldest boy, I think he was already in high school. One uh, middle girl and another younger girl. And I happened to see my poem on the desk of that boy. So I said, oh, you found it. Oh, it's my poem. Can I have it back now? So he looked at me sternly, like frightening me. No, it's my poem, not yours. I said, no, no, it's my poem. You can see, I wrote it. I know it. He said, no, it's not yours. Stop saying it. And I said, but it's mine. You can see my handwriting. It's not your writing. He said, no, it's my poem. Now you get lost or else. He looked very fierce. I was so scared. So I left. What else could I do? 
it was my writing, my poem. And he said it was his. And later, he took it to win a prize from the school because that was a very good school poem. It described all the, the subjects we learned in the classes from the lowest one to the highest in primary school. And until now, I just remember that, what it was all about, but I don't remember one sentence from that poem. It's lost forever. And that boy won a prize. I don't know what prize. Probably one of the good literary prizes. You see, it's very similar now. I'm still burly, even though I'm grown up already. I'm still burly, even though I'm grown up already. <laughs> When I was little, I was bullied by young people. And I was even beaten up by a boy and harassed by my cousin uh, and got uh, shot by them. And one cousin also broke my arm. He just came from nowhere and just uh, wrestled me to the ground. I said, no, no, I, I don't want to. But he continued to wrestle until I broke my arm, the left arm, and then my parents had to put the cast on it. But in natural way, you know, there was one, uh, you can call bush doctor, she knew all this, and she used banana leaves to wrap up herbal things inside. And in just a short while, my arm became whole again. That's just uh, one of those cases. And even one bigger boy in my high school, he just came and slapped me. I don't know what I done. I never knew why he did that. But what could I do? He was big. I'm only small. I'm still small. And when I was younger, I was even smaller, you know, always the smallest in the school. So when I grew up, I thought only immature men do this. But now that I'm grown up, <laughs> already spiritual master, and still being bullied by so-called spiritual people from all sides. Every day I'm attacked from all sides. I'm inside the room alone, and just a room they can't get in. But if I'm outside, I don't know who else would beat me up still just to get what they want. Invisibly, there are still some trying to beat me up, doing other things like claiming my position, accusing me of being a fake Buddha. Oh, I don't mind if I'm not a Buddha. I would be uh, having more time to rest, meditate, and enjoy the inner world. But if I have to do it, I have to do it. It's not like I'm so happy to do it or... I feel so glad that I am a Buddha or anything like that. Oh, my God, working all my life already so hard. I work harder and harder every day now. It seems like more and more work. It just make me busy, all these Mara workers. They don't let me work in my own temple where it's more relaxing. And my body, nobody cares if it's well or not well. My eyes hurt so much because the screen is so bright because I have to have a big screen, otherwise I can't read the words. I ask my disciples from afar, not next to me, but from afar to send me glasses which I can use to read far away from the screen. They bought me maybe a dozen of them, but none of them were the one I wanted, so I gave up. It has been a long time since I gave up, so I just wear anything and just uh, jump back and forth to read my own small writing. Because uh, when I do the um, editing, I can't always write as big as I want. I have to write it small because in some areas you have to squeeze to write in some sections. You have no space in there, so I have to write the smallest possible. I could write very big and then make them small, but I do not know how much the big one can become small and squeeze into that limited area. I just kind of guess, write some in small words, and then continue writing small. And I have to jump back and forth to correct my own mistakes, or adding more, or deleting some. Quite a lot of work, you know, and thinking, have to think also. And only one time... Some months ago, I was half dead, so I said to my team, you know, that I could not work for some days. I don't know how long. 
And those days were blissful. Oh, those days were always in heaven. Eat when you're hungry, sleep when you want to. So wonderful. I had nothing to do with Supreme Master TV. Completely shut off. It was a wonderful time. Oh, my God. I wish I could have that again and again. I can't. So much work to do. Not just remaster television, but team members sometimes couldn't catch up or work too much. Business and initiation in new and different countries, all kinds of things. I have to choose which one in messenger for which country. All kinds of small, small things have to take care of. And vegan restaurants here and there, business up and down. And, oh, I don't know how one person can do so much. I just do. I don't even have time to think. And then still extra work from the demons and all kinds of things. <sighs> right now, without asking me, we will already initiated some people. So they will make offerings to him so he can live comfortably, even go out. Eat animal, people, meat, drink alcohol and all that, which are more expensive. And so he altered the Avatamsaka Sutra for that purpose, to take over my work. He did say that I'm a Buddha, another Buddha, but he knows that in this period of time, only Maitreya Buddha takes charge of the new uh, style of doctrine, of, uh, you know, religion, because it's faster for people, it's easier. Nowadays, people don't have time to keep sitting in the forest, go begging or even go to a temple. I told them to just meditate at home, because their home is a temple, an ashram. And they themselves, their body is a temple for God, for the Buddhas to work with, yeah? Because their Buddha nature is within a human, so their body is a temple already. And all my disciples, most of them have excellent experiences going to different levels, different heavens, different Buddha's lands, even Amitabha Buddha's land, Medicine Buddha's land, and Varochana Buddha's land. They meet them all, and they can communicate with them and also have direct teaching from them. They don't always have to study with me. Of course, I give them explanations through my text through my talk so that they clear some of the doubts in their minds. Some people need that, you know, not everyone has the same level. So they will dare do all this so that he could steal my mission's success. No wonder he waits for me to die. I have checked many more things later. He's not the only one. He did not uh, think of all this by himself. The Mara the witch, and His Majesty, the king of uh, zealous ghosts, pushed him to do that. And later he listened more to Mara and tried to harm me in different ways, you know? And now the reason I say all this is because he already harmed some people, at least three people since he came out since uh, 2022 and blur them into believing in him, whatever he said. I told you already, originally he also had blessings from the saints, so he has some attractive power. And then he is a zealous ghost himself, working under Mara. And the witch also helped him to have some attractive power. So if people go too near him, they will listen to him. They will be sucked into his vicious energy field demonic magnetic field and become, you know, blind, deaf and dumb to anything else. Be poisoned in mind or body and die prematurely. So even they probably would also accept that he changed the text of the sutra, changed the name of the Vasumitra Bodhisattva in the Avatamsaka Sutra. Yeah, he dare do that. Oh my God. Oh, he wouldn't dare if he really knew all of his reincarnations, as he said. He's lying, because if he knew all his incarnations, he would not dare to change the sutra, not even one comma, one period. Yeah. 
So he says something, but his tail comes out all the time. Yeah. He says he's my disciple, and he always emphasizes that, so that my disciples think that he's trustworthy because he is uh, their brother, you know, so they will believe him. Please know that he has never been a quiet messenger, never. I don't even know him, didn't know him as my disciple. It's because he's not a real one, he's just a ghost. He is not even a lowest human in the true meaning of a human. A Guanyin messenger has to be trained and sent out by me when there is a request for initiation. My God. At first he praised me so that I thought he's a devoted person. I'm too busy, I can't just watch everybody. If there is something, then I look and I check. And I also confirm with heaven, but if not, then I think everybody is saintly, you know, meditates, they know that. I do know some of my so-called disciples are still in hell level, even though I let them rest from hell so that they can have a chance to meditate, but some of them don't want to. Some of them come in just to make trouble, just to be nosy, just to steal the method and come out and become a so-called master. I saw some of them, some lady in Vietnam. But most of this are happening only in Vietnam. I don't see anywhere else yet. Maybe I haven't got time to see. Nowadays, all the monsters come out one way or another so that I have to know them. It's good so that I can rescue innocent people who follow them by their demon power of attraction and some hula hub magic. That's what it is. You see now? My God. You never know who is who. Yeah, you never know. Suddenly, uh, San Chai Tong Chi became him, Hui Biu Tong Chi. His Tong Chi and the other Tong Chi are different. San Chai Tong Chi, Sudana, is Kuan Yin Bodhisattva's attendant, the one and only of this name. So he was pure incredibly powerful, and he wanted to learn more, to help Kuan Yin Bodhisattva more efficiently. Yeah? So the Buddha let him go, Kuan Yin Bodhisattva let him go learn. Yeah? It has nothing to do with Thuay Bu. He looks like a dum-dum to me <laughs> because of the way he claims to be Maitreya Buddha. There's no logic, nothing at all. And he says that whoever is the real Maitreya has to explain the secret of Maitreya Buddha Sutra. There's no secret in the Maitreya Buddha Sutra. You print it out and read it. Nothing, no secret at five years old can read it, can understand it. There's nothing secret in there. Unless you are IQ-less, then you will not understand it. There's no need to explain that sutra. Everyone can read it and understand it, just like the Amitabha Buddha Sutra, just like the Medicine Buddha Sutra. The Amitabha Buddha Sutra, the Medicine Buddha Sutra are very simple. Now you know this guy, Hoi Bu, is not to be trusted, and all the cow die saints have told me that. Hoi Bu says that whoever is the real Maitreya has to explain the secret of Maitreya Buddha Sutra. There's no secret in the Maitreya Buddha Sutra. You print it out and read it. Nothing, no secret at five years old can read it, can understand it. There's not a secret in there. Unless you are IQ-less, then you will not understand it. There's no need to explain that sutra. Everyone can read it and understand it, just like the Amitabha Buddha Sutra, just like the Medicine Buddha Sutra. The Amitabha Buddha Sutra, the Medicine Buddha Sutra are very simple. Now you know this guy, Hoi Bu, is not to be trusted, and all the cow die saints have told me that. His Majesty, the King of Kaudaism, and his saintly beings around him and his citizens, they're all saintly. They are on the saintly level and absolutely pure and moral. But there are always some zealous demons who goes mix in just like they mix in in my group. We will fix them all. We will bring them out with their heinous traces and crimes. Anyway, I told the King of Mara that he shouldn't have done that. That's low class, low, low level, even for Mara people. 
and he even encouraged Hui Bu to do those ugly, vicious deeds against all morals and honesty. How can you judge and punish humans while you yourself committed all that you accused or against your propaganda? That is not right. So I said, would you say sorry or not? I asked the king of Mara. He kept quiet. He didn't say anything. So I said, why don't you say anything? If you're wrong, you say sorry. Okay? If I am wrong, I also say sorry. Sometimes I say sorry to my team because there's a lot of work and I appreciate them, but sometimes they lack, they work too slow, maybe too much work and they get tired sometimes. I do understand, but the world goes on. We have to continue working. We can't let people be drowned in ignorance continuously and then go to hell and be a slave for all these ugly, vicious devils, monsters and demons. So I asked the king of Mara, you did that, it's wrong. Huh? Why don't you say sorry at least? So the Mara king didn't say anything. I said, say something. He didn't say sorry. He just said, let me read correctly what he said. You don't have peace. You don't have safety here. But don't be sad. His Majesty, the Karma king will eliminate Hui Bu October 15th, this year, 2024. And before that, I remember, but I didn't know that the Kaudaism saints also told me, don't worry, His Majesty, the King of Karma, will kill him. That's their words, not my words. We'll kill him on October 15 this year. So I asked His Majesty, the King of Karma, he also said, yes, it will be like that. So three authorities confirmed with me, the saints of Kaudai, the King of Mara even, and His Majesty, the King of Karma. They were all there, present. So after I heard all that, I said, no, I don't want him to die because if he dies so quickly, he will go to hell. He never can get out. Is there any way I can help? Who can help him now? And he wasn't all that bad like Trang Tam. He was just pushed by you, the witch. So His Majesty, the witch king, has to also take some responsibility. The Mara king pushed him, gave him power to do bad, encouraged him to do bad because you all want to kill me. And also, Your Majesty, the King of Zealous Ghosts, you also have your hand in it. Why did you still do that? He said, that was before. That was before he accepted my invitation to go to my paradise that I made for him, for them alone, for a similar type of being. So I said, okay, then all of you tell me, you got to help him also to come back, to be a good person, good human being. So I asked His Majesty, the King of Kaudai, Dai Thande Ha, is there any way in Kaudaiism that you can rescue such a person who's fallen? If he repents sincerely, will it help him to live longer so that he can have a chance to undo his uh, misdeeds and have more chance to repent, to concentrate, to meditate? Even don't have to meditate on my method, don't have to respect me, nothing, just go find something or go back to Kaudaism, meditate and practice their method so that he has more time to redeem himself. Of course, I might help if I can, because to fall into relentless torment, punishment and painful hell, that is terrible. I would wish no one to go there at all. Even if he's my worst enemy, I wish no one to go there ever. <sighs> God, they are all ignorant. A ghost is just a ghost. He doesn't know everything. And he's been kind of dragged into some group, like a Maya group. And that has made him become worse and worse. So His Majesty, the king said, yes, we can do that. In Kaudaism, we also can repent. Or he can repent in your way of practicing. And then he will be free. He will not be dead so quickly. He will die later on in life. I say, how long does he have to repent in order to secure himself, to not be dead so quickly without any chance to redeem himself or anyone who helps him? His Majesty, the king say five months repenting every day, every minute he can. The saints from Kaldaism told me also that Hui Bo has to repent to all the saints and sages in Kaldaism, to all the disciples of Kaldaism and also to you and disciples as well. I hope he can do all that. And as he grows better 
in humility and normalcy. Maybe I could also chip in to help him. Right now, I don't think he can receive anything from me, even if I shower tons of blessings or protection or anything for him. He's so deep into wanting a luxurious life and to be famous and have people come and worship him and give him offerings, money and all kinds of stuff. I hope he wakes up quick because he doesn't have much time now. So I said, oh, please tell him, tell Huibu to repent. Or maybe because uh, we air this on Supreme Master Television, he would think about it. If not, I have no other way to help him at all. And I asked the King of Mara, because he's working for you now, he's your subordinate now, would you agree and help him to live longer, repent and let him go so that he can live and then become liberated later or at least not go to hell? The King of Mara say what? He say no, he didn't agree to that. He doesn't want him to live longer or do any repentance. I said, but why? He said, because then he will be lost. The Mara king will lose one soul, one worker, one laborer, you know, one subordinate. I said, my God, that, oh dear, no wonder. Maya is Maya. The king of Mara has no feeling, no sympathy, nothing at all. I said, I thought you had done something good. Maybe you did it for your own good. I don't have time to argue with you, but this is terrible. This is terrible. When I air this on the Supreme Master television, you will lose more than just Weibo. Believe me, you better change your way of life. You be on my side. You be by my side. We be working together, keeping this planet to make the energy, the atmosphere, moral, compassionate, loving, kind towards all kinds. Otherwise, the planet will be lost. And many of your relatives and friends who are in human form or hiding in human form or possessing human form will have nowhere to go, huh? And they will have their children, grandchildren as well. Where would they go? Uh, floating around all the ways in the, the atmosphere and maybe sucked into the black hole, gone for good. You like that? Think about it. This is one last chance, I tell you, okay? Be with me. Work with me. I don't say work for me. Work for your own honor. Work to change yourself. Make yourself have a heart, yeah? And then you will feel much better. Your level will maybe go up and God might grant you a better position even instead of just going and tormenting people and seducing them into doing terrible deeds, wicked deeds, yeah? There is not a majestic kind of, you know, position. I respected you. I call you Your Majesty. Noble King Mara even. Keep that, okay? And continue to develop more. We all need to have some honor, some basic sense of responsibility, goodness, and fairness at least. I've done nothing wrong to you. I'm only teaching my people. Whoever comes to me, I teach. I don't force them in any way. I don't come knocking at their door. They all came voluntarily because they like my teaching. That is allowed. This is not forbidden even in our contract. And you always try to seduce them, even snatch them out of my hand and all that. I have never done anything wrong. So it's not fair that you continue to want me to die and work with other witches, ghosts and the lost ghosts or demons and try to kill me and harm me all the time. You also harm my disciples who are innocent. And you harm innocent people who are not my disciples. There are good but vulnerable ones who are hurt and deluded by you and yours. It's not fair. As a king, no matter what kind of king, you have to have some kind of fairness. You got that? And this is the last warning I have for you. I will not let you continue this way. You hear me. That's what I told him. But he didn't answer anything. So finally, he did say sorry. I remember, but never mind. Let's see what he does to amend, to give meaning to his word. Sorry. Oh my God, I came back and I forgot to turn on the recorder and I have spoken about something, but I did not <laughs> record. I hope I can remember it and tell you. Uh, I guess it was all about Godism. I said that I don't know much about Kaudaism. I never had a chance to meet some teacher or some brother and sister 
in my life to learn about that. But I have respect because I read some at the younger age before I left the world to go to find enlightenment. But that was because I did not notice that I was already enlightened. I always heard the heavenly sound all the time since I was little already. I told you long before, and I thought there's a star's sound. I call it the sound of the stars, because when I went out look up at the sky, the sounds became louder. And of course, when I was in the house, I was busy, so I didn't notice. But when I look up at the sky, because in summer nights, you go out into the yard and sit there, look up or lie down, look up at the sky, then I noticed that the sounds were there ever since, you know. So Kaudaism teaching is for the faithful. Whoever believes in them has to live up to moral standard as well, of course, a high standard of moral lifestyle. And the Kaudai saints came from beyond the karmic world, so they are free to contact the human world without any hindrance, without having to go and bother or even say hello to the king of Mara. The king of Mara cannot do anything to them because they came from beyond this world, beyond karmic consequences, beyond karmic connection, beyond karma. So they come sometimes and use the body of the medium, of the, I call it, transmitter. Mediums are sometimes different, like they could be an instrument for ghosts or a dead person who comes back to life to talk to their relatives, family and friends. But in Kaudaism, for example, words come directly from the saints, from the Kaudai realm. They just use the body of the transmitter, so I prefer to call them transmitters. I think it is more respectful for the sake of the saints who are so loving and caring, taking the time to save human souls by their enlightening sacred teaching from beyond this world. The humans are deeply grateful and never forget your great benevolence. All beings need your generous help and enlightening teaching. I never used this word before. I don't want to use the word medium. It seems to me there are different types of mediums. And the mediums for Kaudaism are different. They transmit the higher teaching from the saints and sages. And the saints and sages come down using the body, the mouth of the transmitter to teach their followers, their faithful, and to bless them, to protect them with their power, to bring them happiness, joy, and bliss, and to protect them in this dangerous and fearful life because there are too many demons all over. The Buddha also say that, that this world is full of demons everywhere. So they will also advise many things. They would talk many times in poems, verses, They're very beautiful. I saw some because sometimes we air Kaudaism teachings on our Supreme Master television. So sometimes I have to read the text and try to see if anything is wrong so I can correct it. If they type wrong, speak wrong or something, then I correct it. I edit. I'm just one of the editors for Supreme Master Television, but that gives me a lot, a lot of work. Oh, a lot of work. Oh, mostly all day and part of the night. And I'm also always happy if I have time to sit, meditate and go into the inner world instead of being always busy with trouble and demonic scenes and deeds of this world. So the Kaudai saints and sages, they come directly to their followers through someone that they think is pure enough. But the thing is, there are different kinds of mediums or transmitters. Of course, some are very good and pure and say the good things and the pure things from the saints, which means receiving and writing correctly. But some just uh, don't write correctly and alter it, like Webu. The saints did not like that, so complain about him. And they even told me that His Majesty, the King of Kama, will kill him on the 15th of October. So I beg all of them, please uh, help him. Let him live longer so he has time, has chance to repent 
to redeem himself, to practice more, to be more humble, to worship all the saints and God, and so he can uh, purify himself as much as possible. So they agree to that, but it's up to Wei Bu if he even wants to do that. If not, then if he doesn't repent, then October 15, what day is today? 26th of August. So September and October, my God, it's uh, more or less more than six weeks only. Oh my God. Oh my God, that's not long. So now the saints in uh, Kaudaism sometimes send their spirit to come down and they don't have to even come right into the scene. They can do it from afar because they have enough power to reach anywhere, to bless people, eh? to protect them and teach them all kinds of moral discipline and benevolent lifestyle if the faithful are pure enough. Like most of the main religions, it just is more alive now. And most of the main religious founders are gone, like Lord Jesus, the Buddha, Guru Nanak, Lord Mahavira, the Baha'i faith founder, the Islam founder. Peace be upon him. They are gone, you see? All of them gone. So the faithful don't feel so connected with their benevolent energy. They hear, but they don't listen. They read the sutra, but they don't understand anything, for example, like that. So the saints from beyond the karma world, beyond this world, send the real teaching. If they are recorder, the body speaks correctly, uses the mouth and just surrenders to the saint. Then they use their body, their mouth to speak and whoever can write it down correctly, then it is the life, the living teaching from the saints, from truly a higher world. So it's lucky if people know about Kaudaism and learn from the saints also. One of my so-called disciples is originally a Kaudai faithful, and then he studies with me, but he still continues to participate in Kaudai activities. Because I told all of them at the initiation that you continue with your religion. You know, go to the temple, go to the church, go to your center, anywhere, anything you do, follow the same. And give offerings to the monks or the priests, whomever you feel like and you trust. So I never told people they have to follow me. No, I'm also teaching the same as the saints. So if they follow some good religion and saintly teaching, I'm just happy that they could stay there and still continue their friendship with their church, their temple, their Kaudai temple, their Hua Hao Buddhism temple, for example, like uh, Prophet Wun Fu Shou. Peace and blessing on him and his followers. Ah, poor Master Wun Fu Shou, poor Master. They only kill the good ones, whoever is in authority. Only kills the good ones, but they let the bad ones run around, blinding people, deluding people, seducing people into bad things, bad teachings, ignoring explanation of the sutras of the Bibles, because they themselves don't understand anything. So how can they teach you anything better? So that's a sad thing. <sighs> I think there's not much more I can tell you. I think we stop for now. It was meant to be a short uh, notice, but then I keep talking about many other things. All right then, may God bless all of us. May our holy saints and sages continue to help humankind and all beings on this planet or any other planet that they have affinity with, that they want to protect. May God Almighty and all the saints and sages, masters, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Mullahs, everywhere, help us, help any of us you can. May you be happy that humans will change their hearts and be true faithful of your sacred teaching, of any holy religious teaching. We thank you, God Almighty, all the masters, all the saints and sages who so benevolently teach us, patiently teach us, patiently wait for us to be awakened, enlightened. Thank you all so much. 
Amen. Amen. Amen.